It's green for go. They're racing. He says go. He says Tara. And Tiger Tara rolls away from them on the home turn. Here comes another big boil over. Big point athleticism at its best. The king is in the castle once more. This is in one race. The rest are almost in another post. She is a star with a capital S. It's going to be a triple treat. A miracle three-peat. Ladies and gentlemen, you have witnessed history here at Menangle. What about that? It's getting right up on the sprint lane and it's going to bolt in. Hello and welcome to episode number 82 of the Sprint Lane podcast for Harness Racing New South Wales. My name is Greg Hayes and this is the Sunday session. Great to have your company. I'm going to talk about harness racing in New South Wales for the next half an hour or so. What is going to be on the podcast today? Well, it has been a big weekend of harness racing with both Bathurst and Wagga running Group 1 events over the last 24 hours. I'm going to concentrate on mainly Bathurst but still talk about Wagga as well. I'll speak with Brad Hewitt. He drove and trained the gold tiara winner, Bittersweet, at Bathurst. She looks pretty good. She's got an unbeaten record to date. Phil and Denise Thurston breed some great youngsters. So I'll ask Brad about his connection with them too. Uh, Brad drove a winner at Wagga today for his dad. Extreme C proved too strong in the Group 1. He had a lap full of horse. He just needed somewhere to go. Some would have gone to the sprint lane, but Brad was travelling that well. He was able to come around the three horses in the straight to win easily. He also got the winner in the... Wagga Paces Cup with Bluto. So plenty to talk with this afternoon with Brad Hewitt. I also want to catch up with Brendan Mikaleff on the podcast. He's the new boss at Bathurst. I think he's been there about four months now. I had a little bit to do with Danny Dwyer over the years at Bathurst, and it is always tough to replace someone who has been at the club for a long time. So I thought I'd catch up with Brendan and get him on the podcast to have a chat to him about his career, his plans for the future. I'll also ask him about the carnival and his thoughts on the success this year. No Menangle Express this week, no racing at Menangle, but I'll have a look at the races at Bathurst and see if I can find a winner or two out of the 10 strong races there. We'll call it the Bathurst Express this week. Plus, Mr T has a lot to be loud and proud about this week after he tipped a three-legged all-up last week. He's made up a lot of ground in the last few weeks. Plus, I'll update Fantasy Harness Racing, so there is a lot to get through in the next half an hour or so. First up, I'm going to speak with Brad Hewitt. but he's about to let this horse have a little bit of rain and have a look at a go. She's exploded away from them, bittersweet near the turn. Going through on the inside of runners then was Kima into second. Our ultimate Jesse runs on with Wicked Susan, but heads were turned for home. Let's just enjoy this moment as bittersweet in overdrive has darted away from Kima, Wicked Susan and our ultimate Jesse. but she is the real deal, all right. Let her look at her. She gets a little shake up, a little bit of a reminder, but she's going to cruise in and win it. Getting home for second, down the outside, our ultimate Jesse, but that was domination. Too good. You know, Group 1's like Bittersweet won a Group 1. Absolutely bolted in. Brad Hewitt, I don't think he uh, he even had to really release the handbrake. Um, it was a demolition job. She won as she liked, and Brad Hewitt's joining me to have a chat. Congratulations, Brad. That was very impressive. Johnny, how are you? Thanks, Mate, um, did, did you have to really do anything? Did you just spay the... Amble up the straight? Yeah, well, she had him sort of beat um, a, a fair way out. Um, uh, yeah, she had him beat a fair way out. Um, then the, the death horse sort of couldn't keep up, and um, yeah, then the one on the back couldn't keep up, and yeah, I just give her a head to 100, and yeah, she sort of put the race away at the yeah, 300 metre mark. She looks well. She's obviously had ability from day dot. She's unbeaten um, and, and just looks to keep going from strength to strength. Is she a filly that is progressive that you think is going to get better as the season goes on? Uh yeah, I, I got no doubt. Like, yeah, sort of only early season, um, like two year old. So they all just yeah, naturally um, improve with a bit of time and experience and that and. Yeah, she's already so big and strong, but but um, yeah, I sort of can't wait for her to step out later in the season. So, what do you do with her now? What's the plans? Uh, well, she went to the paddock straight away. Um, yeah, last night she went back to Forbes, and um, yeah, just gonna give her a, a week or two um, for starters, and yeah, maybe a bit more. Just have to map out what we're going to do, but um, like the race, like the. Um, the slot race in Queensland to be on the card. Um, it's yeah, worth half a million, so obviously you've got to have a 
have a proper look at that. And then obviously got Bird Challenge um, later in the year back home here. And yeah, whether or not um, yeah, she goes to British Crown, that's, that's another thing. But um, yeah, just have to sit down over the next week or so and um, yeah, map out a bit of a plan of attack. She's raced by the Thurstons, Phil and Denise. What's the the connection between you and the Thur- uh, and the Thurstons? Because obviously it's been one for quite. Yeah, um, had um horse. Oh, I started driving a Philly farm for him years. Um, yeah, it would have been close to ten years ago now, I'd say. And um, yeah, she done a really good job. And then yeah, they sent it to us to to train the main dad and. Um, she done a really good job, and from there on, yeah, just sort of struck up a bit of a relationship, and um, had they kept on buying sort of quality mares from here and and over in New Zealand, had like Sweet Molly O'Shea and um, Bonnie Cold Gal to name a couple, and um, yeah, been racing uh, good quality mares for from for yeah a long time now, and oh, got to go, Jazzy Jet was another one. He um. Uh, one of the young oaks, I think, and she's the mother of the filly that uh, won on Saturday night. So they obviously love their breeding. They they put a lot of money into buying good brood mares, and and now they're giving their brood mares a chance by going to top stallions. Yeah, it's been a bit of a um, long range plan for them. Like it yeah, just hadn't happened overnight. They had had this plan like a, a number of years ago now to buy good quality mares and race them, and then yeah, breed them and and sell them at the sales. So, um, yeah, like I said, it hadn't happened overnight and we should have, they've, they've been rewarded with this one. They're lucky enough to keep this filly. The, the mother, unfortunately, um, died um, in, in the paddock one day and yeah, this filly was left and they're yeah, just lucky that yeah, she was born a filly instead of a cult and yeah, they um, kept her instead of selling her. So that's the deal? If, if they have cults, they sell them and, and fillies they keep? No, not really. They, they sell everything if they get the um, the right money in that for them. But it just happened to be yeah, this man was an embryo transfer because I think the mare developed um, a hernia after she carried her first foal and couldn't sort of uh, go in foal and carry it anymore after that. And um, yeah, she was uh, yeah, still, uh, I think, about six months pregnant when she got to go Jazzy Jet actually died. So then... She was born after that, and yeah, they were obviously praying that it was was a filly, and luckily that's what they got. Yeah, um, mate. What about Springfield Amore yesterday uh, in the Gold Crown Consolation? Um, you you were able to work to the front there, and uh, he battled on really well in the straight when he looked like he was going to finish second. Yeah, he's um he's done a really good job. I think I've said before uh, on the radio, and that he's done his third prep, and he's come from doing nothing to. The job that he's done, like he's won two and placed in, in his other, or ran second in his other two starts. So he's done a super job to get um, where he has, but he's definitely crying out for the paddock. And yeah, I was just happy that he could yeah, hold on and get the job done last night. But yeah, he's another one. He was, he's in the paddock already as well. And he'll just come back later in the year for British talent. So it was a, a nice Saturday night, and I'll, I'll pull the curtain back a little bit. I'd actually contacted you on Saturday night and said, look, we'll get, I'll get you on, we'll have a chat about your Saturday night. And then I had a look at the fields at Wagga, and I thought, oh, we might just wait till after Wagga in case you won a big one. It was lucky we did, because you didn't win just one, you won two. Firstly, the one you trained. Um, Bluto, you won the Wagga Pacers Cup. Um, nice performance, but gee, he, was, he, he wanted to get off the track um, right on the winning post. Yeah, that wasn't real good, was it? Um, yeah, a bit, bit dangerous there. He's got plenty of ability, but he's got a few little yeah, quirks and that's still sort of trying to work out with him. But um, there's no doubt in his ability, but they're yeah, just going to get get that rod out of him anyway. Um, he, he When he dashed through, he, he dashed through pretty quickly. Yeah, he probably didn't look as good. I haven't watched the race yet at all, but um, it probably might have looked as good visually as as what he did go because the horse was on the later sort of couldn't keep up and I'd lost the age of momentum and um, like I was actually a fair way off him when I first went in the sprint lane and to still pick him up and first in, in that grade of horse like uh, yeah, he'd done a really good job to, to still pick him up on the line and they went really quick time and that so um, yeah like I said there's no doubt in his ability you just got to Try and get it all together. So one fifty three three for the for the twenty two seventy. Is he another one that might make the trip to Queensland during the Winter Carnival? 
Ja, jeg har sådan en sejrag, sådan en fælling. Det er godt en, men jeg satte hånd i, men jeg er locking straight away, og jeg just kept on, sort of, every time you're working, you just keep on stepping up to the plate, and um, yeah, had that earmark for a little, a little bit now, and just hoping that he can just keep on yeah, stringing a few together, and um, yeah, keep, keep him down at an angle after this, and yeah, but that's definitely a, a bit of a long range target. And what about um, the big one, the Group One Extreme C, one for your dad? That was that was a very impressive performance. The last fifty meters, he just he waltzed away from them. Yeah, he's uh, something special. I think um, that, that loss, he just still doesn't know what he's doing. He's learning, learned all about it. Even yeah, at home, and that he's still just it's like he plays plays games. He's that good. He just yeah. Mucks around in that, but yeah, he, he could be. Yeah, I'm, he's the same in the same sort of situation as Bluto. Like, still learning, learning all about it, and haven't had many starts in that. But to do what he done there today um, against like quality horses like that, like they just, they just don't do it. Mate, I, I thought you might wait to go to the sprint lane, but you obviously were travelling well enough. You just had to get around those horses in front of you. Yeah, the, even. But that that was the case. But as soon as he sprints, he has a tendency to want to sort of run up the track. And um, the the leader wasn't good as what I thought it would. And um, Luke Phillips out three wide had put sort of half or three quarters of length on him. And I just, yeah, just didn't know how I'd go getting him down the sprint lane. So when the option was there to be able to pull back and across carts and sort of give him some clear air, I thought I'd much rather get there. Yeah, give me a chance doing that than trying to um, fight against him and pull him down in the sprint line. So what does your dad do with him now? Um, I don't know. He'd probably just have a have an easy week. I'm not sure if today makes him ineligible for them cab championships. I know he was around that mark. I I'm not sure how many points he picked up t- today, for that or not. But, um, yeah, if he can't do to that, he um he might be another one for Queensland and and yeah possibly even the rising sun ah uh, the Eureka like he's yeah, he's that that quality animal. I, I was going to ask you that because you obviously know what a Eureka horse is. Captain's not got his invitation um, last week. Um, do you you know do you think he's it, you obviously by the way you're talking you, you think he's he's good enough to be in a race like that? Yeah, absolutely, and especially by then, like another um, whatever it is, like close to six months time, or whatever he's going to uh, be a lot better for it and hopefully but um yeah there's no doubt in his ability like he's every bit as good as that horse he's just got to yeah, he just doesn't have the manners and tractability at this stage but yeah he's there's no doubt in he's good enough to be in a race like that mate just quickly captain stock it was it was it good to get that pressure off your your shoulders you, you know you're in the race now you can set him you you basically just have to to get him right for the night yeah, it was and pretty much made me mind up to come and put it here after um, that carnival miracles and that. And um, yeah, once I sort of knew that he was getting a start in the Eureka, like I just yeah, would rather miss this than just be chasing our tail and that. Like, and uh, he'll be back uh, like another couple of months and um, yeah, push on to that. Well, mate, it's been a, a, an unbelievable 24 hours for you. A couple of Group 1s. Congratulations with that. And all the best of luck with Captain's Knock as the Eureka comes around in six months' time. Thank you. Thanks for that, Aiden. Well, the sun has set on a Bathurst Gold Crown Carnival. Brendan Mickleft first in charge as the CEO there at Bathurst, and he has to be congratulated for another very smoothly run carnival. He's joining me to have a chat. Hey, Brendan, how are you? Good, mate. Thank you very much for those kind words. Uh, mate, look, it's it wouldn't be easy. Um, and as your first time in the seat, how did you find it? Yeah, it's uh, it was a fantastic event. The entire 10 days. Uh, was something that I wasn't sure what to expect, but it uh, it's all run smoothly and everyone's had a great time and uh, culminated with some great racing last night, which is just fantastic to see. It, it's interesting because there's so many layers to a Bathurst Gold Crown Carnival. It, it's not just about putting on you know a heats night and a final night. There's just so many events that go into the running of a of a Gold Crown Carnival. Yeah, the the social calendar is massive and. 
you know, it's no secret that we have a social committee that helped us this year uh, and they were absolutely massive. They basically single-handedly organised All Abilities Day, uh, the ball and and ladies' night, and and with our help and our support, they put those those nights together. And without them, it wouldn't have been possible because we're, you know, a lot of our focus is on the racing. Uh, so where they can take that, take the take the ball and run with it on those nights, and just come back to us and report back to us, can help with the final touches. Um, yeah, it, it wouldn't be possible without them. Mate, that All Abilities Day, um, that's something very very special that the club does. It is. And it was even more special this year with Boys to the Bush being our charity, our chosen charity throughout the carnival because so many uh, of of their boys came out to help on the day and prepare and they ran a barbecue and uh, a lot of our industry work with um, kids with disabilities uh, and, you know, to see so many participants uh, bring their clients out is something that uh, was really special to all of them and and even myself, I used to work as a swim coach and I had uh, a young girl that I used to coach. She's not a young girl anymore. She's 19. That's Chloe Osborne. Uh, to have her come out and be our keynote speaker, she's on track to swim at the Paralympics uh, this year. Trials are in um, mid-June, so she's on track to qualify for her, her first Paralympics. And I remember when I first started coaching her, she had, was just getting into swimming and to see her grow and develop. It's what all all abilities day is all about is is giving these guys an opportunity to get out in the community and uh, show what they can really do. Mate, you must ha- have an interesting background. Um, obviously, mentioned the swim coaching there, but um, did a commerce degree. Tell us a little bit about you. Yeah, mate, I, I did a all trades. I um, I studied at Sydney Uni. Uh, I have a bachelor of commerce with a major in quantity business analysis. So I've always been really interested in, in business and, and data. Uh, but I, after six months of accounting, I thought my dream was I was a swimmer growing up and I was always wanted to be a swim coach and uh, probably resisted against what my parents wanted and, and through the accounting had into the ring and then and became a swim coach and was the head coach at Sydney Uni at a very young age of 23 and um, moved on to coaching a couple of national champions, which was awesome. Uh, and then COVID hit, and that's when I started BPM Bloodstock, um, and that really it just yeah, it took off. It was great. We started with two horses, and we built up to about twenty five to thirty horses uh, to a to a sit where we put me in a situation where I really couldn't do both um, coaching and BPM Bloodstock. So I I left the coaching ranks, and um, yeah, and that's what that's my first I suppose major introduction into harness racing. I had always been an avid fan. Um, my old man, Paul Mifflis, was always in the media and my granddad was a trainer, so I was around harness racing my whole life. But from a working perspective, that's what really brought me into the industry and helped me build my name in the industry and, and led me to landing this role of CEO. So, mate, do you miss the swimming coaching? Yes and no. I miss the connection I had with the swimmers and seeing them grow. I mean, Chloe is a perfect example of that. Uh, but I, I suppose it was... Um, a challenge in Sydney being on a on a limited income, um, and and at one stage you kind of got to look at it as a young guy. You don't mind it, but then you got to look at it right. Well, if I'm gonna, um, you know, live my life in Sydney or in <laughs> here, anywhere in Australia, you know, the the financials become a big part of it, and uh, the financial incentive really wasn't there. Um, and and when BPM took off, that's why I went that way, and obviously landing the CEO role has been a massive help to myself personally and and professionally as well so bpm how how big has that got now for you so my partner's managing all that now and i help out um behind the scenes with a few things uh we've got 25 horses at the moment and and between the two of us she also runs a, a tuition business for us um so between the two of us that 25 20 to 25 horses is, is a nice number that we can manage and make sure that we're still providing our owners with um, everything that we offer, our pre post race reports, nights at the track, stable visits, all the rest of it. Um, so, yeah, so we found a nice happy medium and it is, it is you know, getting owners involved in the sport is something that I love doing. So it I liken BPM a little bit to swim coaching because I love educating people about harness racing and ownership and that's what BPM allows, allows us to both do. 
Um, whereas obviously, you know, the CEO role is a lot more about the business side and, and behind the scenes. And do you concentrate your horses just in New South Wales or if need be, do you send them interstate? Uh, we've only got two horses interstate, two horses up in Queensland, uh, but most, all the rest of them are here in New South Wales. A big part of that is we have had horses interstate before. So we've had a few big bred horses, and um, but a lot of the time the owners love to go to the track, and it's a part of the experience. Uh, again, you know, if, if horses started at, in the metro area, but then aren't quite up to scratch there, we'll move them out to the country if we have to. But we've now got a really good rapport with trainers all around New South Wales, and building those relationships has taken time, but. Everybody understands the business model now and, and everyone knows that, hey, if, if a horse isn't working out for you, it's okay. We'll move the horse elsewhere and another horse will come to them because, um, you know, they do well by me and I do well by them. And now we, as I said, have those relationships. Um, yeah, just build on it and it's, it's, it's become really easy because of the time it's taken to build those relationships. Now, what took you to Bathurst? Uh, you obviously said, you know, you uh, you got to a stage in your life, you, and obviously COVID hit, but you you needed to to find that that income. Um, how how did you end up in Bathurst? So, uh, probably about two years ago, maybe two and a half years ago, Denny Dwyer actually called me and asked me. He saw what I was doing with him and asked me to see if I could come up and um, syndicate a few horses with the club. Uh, to help bring members back to the track. And I had done a little presentation to Newcastle, Bathurst and Wagga on that. And things really clicked at Bathurst. Uh, we had three horses who did a really nice job for us. Uh, and one of them raced on Eureka Night in the True Blue final. I was racing a couple of country series heats, uh, country series finals. And um, and then when Denny announced his resignation, I hadn't really thought about applying for the role. Um, and him and I had a good chat and he asked, you know, he thought I'd make a good fit for the role and he was seeing what I was doing with um, with those syndicate horses and what I was able to put on for those owners and and with, he, he knew my background um, with the business degree and so, yeah, he asked me to apply and, and I did and, yeah, that's, that's how I landed the gig. Have, how have you found? How have you found that, that move back? Well, I guess you were, you're doing the administration in the BPM, but, um, you know, how have you found the, the race club administration? Yeah, it's, it's actually been something I've really enjoyed. Um, I suppose when I was coaching, you know, a big part of that was uh, I was coaching at quite a high level. So we had sports scientists, we had biomechanists, um, we had other staff, we had junior coaches, and, and I was managing a team around the swimmers then. And that was probably something that I missed with BPM was I didn't, didn't have that close-knit team. One thing that I really love doing is building a culture at, at a place. Uh, and, you know, I'd, I've never worked in hospitality before, so... You know, giving our bar manager the opportunity to take that on board and, and I work with him and support him is how I see my role is. Um, that's how I see myself being successful in the role. I know that I can't uh, oversee and, and and run everything myself because that's not how a club's going to work. I, I need to rely on my, on my key team members uh, to be able to look after their areas and I need to oversee everything to make sure that they're smoothly and, and support them. And that's what I love about this role is, you know, there's certain things that I've got to take on. But if I can build up a team with the right people around me, I know we're going to be very successful. So how have you found the uh, the, the Gold Crown Carnival experience? Uh, it's been fantastic. I was, I was only last night, I was down at the presentation area after the last and the DJ started and I saw you know, all our participants and owners and they're all up there having a great time after the last and I look up and I, I think to myself, this is this is what it's about. This is what I love doing is sitting back in the background and, and looking up and being able to put on a show for everybody. And that's what the whole entire 10 days has been. No matter who you are in the community, there's been a, a time for you over the last 10 days. And um, yeah, now it's, a, now it's time for a full review to see how we can do it bigger and better for next year. And it's exciting times for Bathurst too because you've got the training centre ready to go. Yes, the training centre hopefully will be open in the next couple of months. That is run by Harness Race in New South Wales. Uh, but working in with them now is, you know, we're going to, we're advertising for a facilities manager, um, who will coexist between the training centre and the track as will the track curator. So, uh, it's probably a really good opportunity for, you know, the club and Harness Race in New South Wales to build 
back a really good relationship and to make sure that we're, we're all moving together on the same path. Mate, it's obviously, you know, you're a very talented man and, and you, you're good at what you do. Is it something, could you see yourself in harness racing administration for years to come? If I'll, I'll backtrack, if somebody uh, asked me when I was leaving year 12 that I'd be the CEO at a harness racing club when I was 30, uh, I would have pinched myself and laughed at them because I could never have seen how I would have got into this position. Uh, but now I have and I've been here for four months. It's something that I absolutely love. I mean, harness racing has been in my veins my entire life. And now that I'm here, I'll definitely be uh, savouring it. And, yeah, I mean, I'd love to to stay in harness racing because, as I said, it's something that's a massive passion of mine. And having being able to have an impact and an influence on the industry, that's done so much for me. You know, I had my fourth birthday at the Penrith uh, Greyhounds because I used to watch sky racing with my dad as as a toddler. (laughs) <laughs> and that's how I learnt my numbers and colours. So to be able to give back to an industry that's given me so much is, is something that means a lot, and if I can stay in it, that'd be terrific. And, mate, what about a highlight from the, from the, from the carnival for you? What, what was probably your personal highlight from the last week and a half? It would have to be the racing. I would absolutely love the early two-year-old racing, uh, seeing bittersweet go 54 on a rear last night was just breathtaking and um, to see how much it meant to winning connections and, and even Fox Dan, you know, he saved them off and did such a wonderful job and what it meant to teams have. Um, I know I know how hard it is to win in a, a big race and to see what it meant to them uh, was, yeah, it, it, it's what it, it's what racing's all about. Everybody has an opportunity to, to get involved in a horse and to to race for the big money on the big nights and uh, to see the emotion come out of the owners, that meant a lot to me. Well, mate, congratulations. Um, never easy walking into a club because everyone compares you to what um, the last guy did and, and Danny Dwyer was fantastic at, at what he did. Mate, you have run the Gold Crown Carnival with uh, expertise and um, Bathurst is very lucky to have you. Congratulations. Well done. Mate, thank you very much. And just on that, Danny and Marianne laid an awesome platform for our team and without them you know we took over when you know half the things were booked half the things weren't booked and without their guidance over a month's period where they transitioned us over we we definitely wouldn't have been able to make it possible so a massive thank you to them and and a massive thank you for the the team that has become because again without their support uh, I wouldn't be here today doing this interview so big thank you to everybody who's helped us get here today. Time for the Bathurst Express. No man angle on Saturday night, but there were some very nice horses competing at Bathurst, and the form out of the carnival is normally pretty good, so let's get into these 10 races. Race one was the gold bracelet consolation. The favourite was Stylish Lazarus at 165. When the starter said go, they quickly found their positions. Stylish Lazarus showed speed and crossed Dream Melody. Behind them on the pegs was Dreamtime Nala, Miss Mickey May, and Fireproof. The running line was Nigella Bling. She's got a reason. Uh, Mickey's bride, pencil me in, and I can try. Pretty uneventful first lap. Speed was constant, 28.5 followed by 30. Now in the third quarter, Stylish Lazarus started to quicken the tempo. Mickey's Bride took off approaching the 500 and a few wanted to get moving at the same time. Caused a bit of a chain reaction and in the end it was I Can Try that got spat out the back in a gallop. Very hard to tell how much ground she lost. She but she was out of the picture on the television screen. Uh, 28-5 for the third quarter. Stylish Lazarus looked to have them all beaten. Dream Melody went back to the sprint lane, and then all of a sudden, I can try, after getting into more trouble than the early explorers, came via the cape around them and whooshed down the outside to win. Huge performance, slow final quarter, uh, leader to win a 29-8, but still a remarkable win. Stylish Lazarus had its chance, so too did Dream Melody. Dreamtime Nala got through after racing on the pegs and Pencil Me In did a good job as a maiden. Surely there's a win for her somewhere. That was race one. Race two was the gold chalice consolation and the favourite in the race was Wingman Lou at $3.10. The speed was Sir Knight and know the score. Uh, Wingman Lou kept coming after drawing wide and was able to work to the front. So on the pegs it was Wingman Lou, Sir Knight, know the score, ideal timing, Tomahawk Bart and Johnny's Blue. The running line was Moreland Boy, Limbo Lenny, Debonair and Lettuce Nipya. Uh, in saying that, it did take Moreland Boy 
a while to get to the spot outside the leader. 28.5 and 30.9 were the first two quarters. Debonair took off at the 600 and Lettuce Nipia was straight onto its back. Ideal timing got off the inside and into the three wide line. 28.3 for the third quarter. As they turned, Sir Knight came back to the inside. The leader kicked for home. Debonair stalled out three wide and Lettuce Nipia was forced to go four wide but still continued to charge home. Wingman Lou had too big a break. Lettuce Nipia couldn't reel it in. Uh, no, the score got home nicely through the middle to grab third. Sir Knight every chance, 28-4 for a 156 mile. Race three was the honoree stakes final. The favourite was Sports Narrator at $2.50. It showed good speed off the inside. Moz London began well from a wide draw and challenge for the lead. Couldn't get in, but it made plenty of room to get in behind the lead. A really good drive. So Sports Narrator, Moz London, Pacing Hope, Beer Money and Don Boston. Running line, Tossy Sun, Satellite Simba, Yes You May, Mick Danger and Caught on the Edge. 27-6, 29-5 the early quarters. Tossy Sun was being slapped along to try and get up outside the leader but couldn't. Satellite Simba was in the 1-1. It was struggling to hold its spot as well. Uh, its spot as well. So it forced the hand of Yes You May and Mick Danger to take off. 27-9 the third quarter allowed the leader and behind the leader to get a big break on them turning for home and Moz London was able to go back to the sprint lane for its shot at sports narrator. Back in the field, caught on the edge, was forced to come five and six wide while Don Boston was screaming for the sprint lane and was being held up. Moz London uh, with a cold shot proved too strong in the straight. Smart drive Isabel Ross. Sports narrator got second. Don Boston, the old boy, turning back the clock for a strong third. And caught on the edge, kept coming up the straight for fourth. Not much else to report. Final quarter, 29-4. Overall, 153.9. Race number four, the favourite in the Mayor's Cup was Can't Find a Better Man at $1.04. There was speed early from Cassius Deck who led before handing over to On Deadline and they quickly found their position. So on the pegs, it was On Deadline, Cassius Deck, Jungle Baby and My Mate Pog. The running line was Porter Prince, Heavenly Holly, Spirit King, Can't Find a Better Man and Old Luke. This was over the longer trip. McCarthy on Can't Find a Better Man made his move three wide coming into the straight the final time. 30.9, 29.4 were the first two quarters. Fast enough to keep him at bay but slow enough to keep something left at the end for On Deadline. When Can't Find a Better Man came, the speed went on. 27-8 for the third quarter, and that put a few under pressure. Old Luke tried to come wide, but the speed was brutal, and the first two slipped away on the turn with everything else struggling. Can't Find a Better Man got unbalanced at the top of the straight and then couldn't reel in on deadline. Nathan Turnbull did his best impersonation of a plank as he laid right out on the line to lift on deadline to victory and a huge boil over. I thought Heavenly Holly might rally because she had been hitting the line well at Menangle. Cassius Deck held on for third after racing behind the leader. Death Seat Porter Prince held on for fourth. Not a lot else. Race number five, it was the bracelet for the three-year-old fillies. Luxa Turner was the $2.20 favourite. There was some speed early from Aramet Girl, who was drawn wide on the track, and Libby Lou drawn down on the inside, and they went hard early before Aramet Girl went up in the air and left Libby Lou in front. But it also left room for Luxa Turner to come off the inside from the second row to shoot around to the lead. First quarter, brutal, 26-6 at Bathurst. So they settled down with Luxa Turner in front of Libby Lou, Soho, Honey Rider, Boulevard of Dreams, Mammals Heart, running line. Um, and it did take them a while to get to their spots after Aramet Girl broke, but it was Eureka Joe, Soho, Vespa Lynn, Sarah, uh, Sarah Desloy and Centrefelli. They backed the speed off, 30.6 second quarter, but the speed went on again in the third quarter. Eureka Joe was struggling, approaching the bend at 27-5. Uh, McCarthy on Soho Vespalin was forced to come around Eureka Joe and as it drop, dropped off, it allowed Blake to come to the outside of Luxa Turner with Libby Lou. Now Soho Honey Rider took its spot and then got to the sprint lane first and had its full speed and momentum up. Luxa Turner was all out as they entered the straight. Libby Lou looked like she was spinning her wheels. Mick Stanley pushed up with Soho Honey Rider. Soho Vespa Lynn was taking an age to wind up. Boulevard of Dreams was looking for a run everywhere while being driven out. 30 seconds, the final quarter, they were tired, but Soho Honey Rider was too good. Libby Lou, second, only just missed. Soho Vespa Lynn gave Stanley first and third. Boulevard of Dreams was unlucky, um, did have a soft run on the pegs. Luxa Turner, jury out with her, worked hard in the first quarter to get to the front, but she didn't look like her brilliant self in the heats. Maybe this series will bring her on, only time will tell. She definitely needs to improve on what we saw at Bathurst. Race six was the gold chalice for the three-year-old boys. The favourite was Wardan Buddy at $2.70. Minos showed speed off the inside, as did a few, but it was Wardan Buddy who progressed from a wide draw to find the front off Minos. Behind them, Royal Cruiser, Humble and American Spirit. 
The running line was Ravishing Sloy, Dashing, Soho Spectre and Nathan Street. Keeping in mind, Navanta Rising galloped soon after they let them go. Now, Ravishing Sloy couldn't get anywhere near the leader from the chair and basically sat next to Humble on the pegs. 27-1 first quarter. And with no horses to its outside, Wardan Buddy walked them through the second quarter in 31 seconds. This forced the hand of Soho Spectre, who took off to the chair. Nathan Street came three wide as well, but it got caught in no man's land as Ravishing Sloy was struggling in the running line. With Ravishing Sloy unable to hold its spot, Royal Cruiser came away from the pegs to chase out after the leader. 26-9 that third quarter. Took a few of them out of play. Wardan Buddy turned, looked the winner. Minos came to its outside and was able to wear it down in the straight. Big salute from Robbie Morris. Horses been racing really well. Former Kiwi, one start over there for a win. One on debut. Do, uh, try again. One on debut in Australia, and then placed in a Derby heat, the Derby final. So I think it might have meant something for the stable to get that win for Mick Boots. Horse finally got a big one. American Spirit was dragged to the outside in the straight. Got home well for fifth. Royal Cruiser did too much in that fast third quarter. Race number seven, Gold Tiara, a short price favourite, was bittersweet at $1.06. There went too many questions asked of the favourite earlier. She held them comfortably. Peace Out, who looked set to get a nice run, galloped and was out of play. Bittersweet led Spicy Shannon. Wicked Susan dropped three pegs. Our ultimate Jesse in the swift one. Kima left. She's cruising uh, go by early in, in, in the running line and personified swept up three wide to finally work to the chair by the time they got to the judge the first time. Halfway down the back straight, Spicy Shannon was in pain behind the leader. Personified was sticking to its gun, uh, to its guns. Kima looked to be going okay. Wicked Susan had to come around the tiring Spicy Shannon, but Bittersweet was in second gear. She was doing it so easily. 29-1, 29-4, then 28 for the third quarter. She raced away to score the easiest of wins for Brad Hewitt. It was a race for second. Our ultimate Jesse got home hard to grab second. Wicked Susan saved ground everywhere to run third. Good drive, Lee Sutton. And Kima held on for fourth. Only a metre separated second, third and fourth. It was 35 metres back to fifth. The winner looked pretty special. Race 8, the gold crown. The favourite was Fox Dan from Barrier 1 at $1.95. Soho Fury galloped and took no competitive part. Fox Dan led pretty easily. A few worked around to sit outside him. First, it was business in heaven before Sweet on Lexi was forced to go around and sit parked. So on the pegs, Fox Dan, Soho the real deal, Jack's ultimate Fury and Wazza. Running line was Sweet on Lexi, business in heaven, my ultimate Barney, Sanchez and ultimate Cruiser. 28.8, followed by 30.2. They ran down the back in 27.6. That got Sweet on Lexi out of its comfort zone. With the running line stalling, it forced my ultimate Barney out wide. Wazza had to wait for the sprint lane to open up. Fox Dan kicked for home before the home turn. Set up a commanding lead. My ultimate Barney savaged the line to cut the margin down to 3.8 metres. Never a winning hope, though. Final quarter, 28.6, 154.7. Second horse went well. So too did Wazza after having to wait for that sprint lane to open up. Keeping in mind, he got to the pegs pretty early. Race 9, He's a Treacherous was the favourite at $1.75. It showed good speed off the inside and held pretty comfortably before Springfield and Moray came and asked the question. Morris must have been happy to take that final crack and let the second fave go. On the pegs, it was Springfield and Moray, He's a Treacherous, La Cavaletta, Womboyne Machete and Mac Bon. The running line was a Hoka Dream, Kingston Rainbow and Spitfire. Dance with Karma was in the running line, but ducked back to the pegs when Mac Bon eased to come around the entire field. 29-8, 31-3. So the leader got a big chance to catch its breath. Mac Bond dashed around to the chair to keep the leaders honest, but they still only went 29-1 through that third quarter. It was going to become a dash up the straight. Springfield and Moray came off the inside, gave the fave plenty of room. It looked like he's a treacherous was going to get there, but right on the line, Springfield and Moray gave a big kick and held on. Final quarter, 28-3, 157-9 the mile. La Cavaletta used the pegs to run third. Mac Bond toughed it out, and I thought it was good in the circumstances. Womboyne Machete was looking for room in the straight. It's only tiny, tiny but did uh, a pretty good job late. Race number 10, favourite Soho Americano at 160. Speed early from Drama Chick and Ava Leanne, while Soho Americano was pushing forward out three wide. Got a little bit squeezy, and Ava Leanne galloped. Luke McCarthy got 10 days out of this race as well. In the end, Soho Americano was able to get down and find the front, but as soon as it did, Freedom Mart came a-calling and got the front. So it was Freedom Mart, Soho Americano, Drama Chick, something for Lexi. Running line, syncopated shuffle, upstream and Dolly Rocket. Luke. Not wanting to be pocketed, came off the inside, turning out of the straight with Soho Americano. 28-8, 29-2. Soho Americano put away Freedom Art down the back straight, but Drama Chick was able to get off the inside when that happened. Upstream followed through too. Soho Americano turned in front, looked to be in some trouble. 
drama chick just kept on coming and in the shadows of the post got there upstream finished off well for third 30.3 for a 157.7 mile best win of the night I can try for Kerry and Robbie speaks for itself huge win galloped and still proved too strong Best beaten performance of the night. My ultimate Barney couldn't sight the leader on the turn and made up a lot of ground without really being a winning hope. And best driver of the night. There's a few of these, but I'll go with Isabel Ross on Moz London. Um, showed speed, made room to drop in behind the leader and then out sprinted the fave up the straight. Smart driving too good. Isabel Ross, driver of the night. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Winning. Hey. That's pretty good. Winner! That was legitness. That I say, all right, all right, all right. Wow, winning. Bam! Just like that. That's all there is to it. That's, that's all there is to it. A winner! Just like that. I'm the winner! Is... Oh, it's getting close in the tipping comp. Mr. T, he got a three legged all up during the week. $1.10, $1.40. Forty and a dollar twenty with a three leg winner, so that all up he gets thirty seven dollars for his twenty, and both of mine ran placings, but that doesn't help when you have it for the win. So, Mister T is minus forty four dollars, and I'm minus forty. There's only four dollars between us. Mister T's two Bathurst Wednesday race five number nine Carlo Gambino finished second in the Canberra Cup, drawn perfectly for this race. Best saved up for one last crack at them. Looks to have a bit on its rivals here, so can probably do a bit more work in a race like this and does get Jet Turnbull with the claim. So that's race five, number nine, Carlo Gambino. And race seven, number three, Judith Gwenda. Mr. T coming back to this one. He's tipped it before, but it's still a maiden after 15 starts. Surely Wednesday is the night for it. Third last time out, race seven, number three, Judith Gwenda. My two, Menangle Tuesday, race eight, number one, my ultimate Flynn, trialled well recently, main dangers are drawn out wide on the track, I can see it getting a very good run in transit, and if it gets the right run, I think it'll take a lot of running down late. I am worried about Maria Alagonda, she drops back from Saturday Night Company, and she's clearly the main danger, but just off the good draw, I'm going race eight, number one, my ultimate Flynn. And in the following race, race nine, number nine, Dragon Tattoo for Dean Atkinson, a couple of nice horses in this one, but Dragon Tattoo's in good form with a last start victory. He gets the services of Harrison Ross as well, and I think it's going to take some beating. Race 9, number 9, Dragon Tattoo. Beautifully bred, stable in form, and a good junior driver who is driving plenty of winners at the moment. Fantasy Harness Racing Update. Champo 71 is 28 points in front, so has re-established a bit of a lead after seeing that lead dwindle away. Mays is second. Manning 1990 is in third. My team is hanging into a spot in the top 100. I'm 78th overall. Round 18 was won by In The Van with 909 points. Haley I finished second with 900 and what a fill-up was third with 896. You needed to have Brad Hewitt this week. He scored plenty of points with his Group 1 win on Saturday night. Jet, uh, Jet Turnbull has become very affordable. He keeps dropping in price. He's now down to 737000 Tom Ison becomes a must-have after his suspension finished. And Cam Hart just continues to get more, more expensive every week. That just about wraps up the podcast. Great to catch up with Brad Hewitt and Brendan Mikalev. What a Bathurst Gold Crown Carnival it has been. The town gets right behind it every year. Thought I better wait for Wagga today to speak with Brad just in case he won a big one. And luckily I did because he ended up winning two of them. Hope you've enjoyed the podcast and I'll catch you again next week.